Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This week, we're going to talk about uh, the atmosphere. We're going to talk about atmospheric pressure. We're going to talk about wind. We're going to talk about deserts, true deserts, and orographic deserts, and high elevation deserts. But first, we're going to get started talking about temperature. So I keep talking about temperature and temperature controls, or I've mentioned temperature controls. I know that I've mentioned continentality and when we talked about oceans. Um, I believe I mentioned that <clears throat> water has a low, sorry, high specific heat capacity, meaning it takes a lot of energy for water to change its temperature. So if you live next to an ocean, you're going to have more temperate, a more temperate climate. So we are talking about the atmosphere and it's all part of understanding the climate. But first, let's talk temperature controls and then we'll get into atmospheric pressure and wind. Okay. So first we're going to share our screen with this one. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. So I've alluded to mention temperature controls. Um, uh, last week we talked about how their insulation over the globe, <clears throat> you know, you have this surplus of heat coming into the tropics you have a deficit of of heat and energy at the uh, poles and how we essentially every single day have this balance of temperature and energy inside the earth but it's not evenly distributed so the reason that we don't have even distribu distribution of heating is mostly because of these five different things here so we want to go over these five different controls of temperature temperature controls, controls of temperature. So the most important thing, and I know I've said this before and you can probably figure it out anyway, the most important thing when it comes to temperature is latitude, how close you are to the equator. If you are close to the equator, like we learned last week, if you're in the tropics, that's where the sun is focused. The declination of the sun at some, like any given time of the year is gonna be somewhere between 23 and a half degrees north of the equator and 23 and a half degrees south of the equator. So you have a surplus of the sun's energy, just like we have talked about multiple times. So latitude is gonna be the number one thing that affects your temperature. If you are close to the equator or if you are close to the poles, your temperature is going to be most affected by where you are in relation to the equator because of all the things we've learned about because of the insulation of the sun the focus of the sun in the tropics the way that the earth is tilted the way that sometimes of the year the southern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun and other times of the year the northern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun so that's number one latitude most important most important second is altitude like we talked about last week if you go up in elevation when you go up in elevation um, temperature goes down as long as you're using the normal lapse rate, which we talked about last week. The normal laps, well, lapse rate is three and a half degrees per thousand feet. So as long as you're going up in altitude, you are going to see it lower, lower, lower temperature, right? As long as we're in the troposphere, if you remember from last week. So we call that adiabatic cooling right? Temperature that changes because of elevation. When you go up in elevation, the temperature gets cooler. Now, I showed you a video earlier in the semester that had to do with mountain building and the Himalayas. And if you remember, they talked about the snow line and how the snow line, if you're closer to the equator, you have to go up as much as five miles to get to an altitude that's high enough for it to freeze. As opposed to if we went up to the high latitudes, somewhere in Alaska, for example, you could be at sea level and you're far enough away from the equator that it's, you could see frozen glaciers, frozen snow, it can snow at sea level. So again, altitude, Latitude is the most important, but altitude is very important as well, but it still relates to latitude. So if we are at the equator, we could feasibly get up high enough in altitude to where we would just be in constant snow and a constant snowpack, but because we're at the equator, it's gonna have to be higher than if we were at 60 degrees north of the equator, 90 degrees north of the equator, even 40 degrees north of the equator. So <clears throat> I think I've mentioned this before, but Ecuador, 
Ecuador is a country in South America. It's very small. It's named after the equator because it's on the equator and it's right in the Andes and uh, Quito is the capital and Quito is actually the highest elevation capital in the world. So even though it's right on the equator, I was in Quito for about six weeks when I was in graduate school <clears throat> doing uh, research and um, the days were 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of nighttime, just like we talked about. And the temperature was pretty temperate. So we were high up in elevation. I'm forgetting what, how high Quito is. I think it's 14,000 feet. Um, maybe not that high, maybe 12,000 feet, maybe 9,000 feet. Oh, it's gonna bug me. <clears throat> but it's high up. It can't be 14,000 feet, that's too high. Um, it's uh, high up in elevation, so it's cool. It's like a temperate 70 degrees, even though we're on the equator. So altitude is the second biggest thing that's going to affect temperature. But again, it's still gonna to relate to latitude because if you're at the equator, you have to go up much, 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 much higher before you're going to get to a snow line as opposed to if we were high up in latitude and altitude, just imagine how cold that would be. Okay, another thing that's going to affect temperature <clears throat> is cloud cover. So cloud cover, you can, I remember maybe from last week when I lectured about how clouds absorb, reflect, um, and transmit the sun's energy. So depending on how much cloud cover we, we have and depending on how much of the sun's energy is being transmitted through those clouds or reflected back before we have a whole lot of that heat retained in our atmosphere, cloud cover makes a difference. Cloud cover also makes a difference. At the end of the lecture last week, I talked about how clouds can also serve as um, if you have like a, a valley, you know, and you have clouds or particularly smog, which we'll come back to when we talk about fog, <clears throat> but how you can have this inverse uh, layer where if you're in a valley and you have a layer of clouds right here, then you can have heat that's trapped in this valley that can't necessarily transmit through these clouds. So <clears throat> cloud cover, important. And then land water differences. And that's a phrase I keep using, continentality. So continentality also refers to land water differences. Essentially, clouds, not clouds, rock, has a low specific heat capacity. And that means that it doesn't take a lot of energy for a rock to heat up. Whereas water has a high specific heat capacity, so it takes more energy for that water to heat up. So what happens if you're in the middle of a continent, like just imagine Asia, and um, uh, do I wanna bring up a map? Sure, let's bring up a map of Asia. Let's bring up a map of the world. This is geography after all. Okay, <clears throat> so there we go. Oh, now it's off skew. Anyway, um, so look at Asia. Asia is a gigantic continent. It goes all the way, it includes Europe. Don't argue with me on that, I'm a geographer. Um, so we have this gigantic rock, basically. It's not a rock. I know it's not a rock. It's a continent. But for purposes of what we're talking about right now, it's a, it's a rock. So it has a very low specific heat capacity, which means that if you're right here, right in the middle of just nowhere Russia, um, your temperature range is going to be huge throughout the year because you're up in a high latitude. Remember, that's very important. Um, and so most of the year, you're not getting a lot of the sun's energy. And because you're basically sitting on a giant rock, the temperature is going to drop very, very low. But for a short period of time in the summer, the sun is going to be focused on Mother Russia up here. And that focus is going to lead to this, like, this spike in temperature. And that spike in temperature is going to affect the weather of the entire continent of Asia. Um, <clears throat> what essentially happens is, well, we'll get into it in just a minute. So continentality uh, is when you're in the middle of a continent and because continents have a low specific heat capacity or because rock has a low specific heat capacity, your temperature is going to go very, very high up in the summer and very low in the winter. If we looked at other places, like if we looked at um, 
a place like Tennessee, for example, Tennessee here in the US, it's inland. Uh, it's at a lower latitude. So they get really, really hot in the summer, but they get pretty cold winters because they're locked in land. So if we were next to the ocean, which, hey, we are, um, <clears throat> what, is our, what is our weather cycle like throughout the year? What is the climate in Santa Barbara throughout the year? Well, there's a couple of things happening here. One is we're affected by a microclimate, um, <clears throat> which is the effect of having these mountains right here, and then this cold ocean current. So that comes up later when we talk about fog, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> but because we are next to the water, we see kind of slower ranges in uh, in our temperature, or I should say milder ranges in our temperature. So what happens, and this, this is one of the reasons that we have our microclimate because of this land water difference, and I'll, I'll explain that later when we get into fog. That'll be in our next lecture, by the way. But, um, but because we're next to a cold ocean, uh, it takes us longer to heat up. So right now, we're getting kind of warmish. I don't know, it's in the, maybe in the 70s, maybe in the high 60s. Um, and then it'll take us a while to get into summer. And we'll get into summer because, you know, we have fog. And that's because of our microclimate. Um, we'll get into summer around July. July, the temperature will start to go up if the fog has burned off. August will be warm. Se warm. September will be warm, right? October sometimes here in Santa Barbara is pretty warm sometimes even into November. And so what, what is happening is because we're next to the ocean and a cold ocean current, while the, the valley in San Ynez is gonna heat up real fast. So the valley in San Ynez is going to see their temperature spike pretty soon and they have a colder winter, right? We have a winter that maybe gets us into the 70s, maybe gets us into the 60s, a couple of days a year, we might be all the way into the 40s, but uh, San Ynez, the valley is experiencing freezing cold temperatures, you know, um, at night and sometimes during the day. And then their summer is going to be really, really hot. They're going to be in the 90s well before we're in the 90s, and they're going to be over 100 degrees, and we're going to be a good 10 to 20 degrees cooler than them. Why is that? Because they're in the middle of a rock because of these land water differences. We're next to an ocean, it takes longer for us to heat up. And by the time we do heat up, it takes us longer to cool down because in fall, it's gonna be warmer here and it'll be cooling down in the valley because their temperature is gonna spike and then drop. Essentially what's happening is they're drier and water, whether it's in the ocean, in a lake or in the atmosphere all around us, um, if we have what's called a humidity, <clears throat> humidity is where you have more, this is like a parcel of air that I'm holding up. If you have a parcel of air that has a good amount of humidity in it, a good amount of water vapor, that water vapor is going to hang on to the temperature too. So I'll come back to that later when I talk about humidity. But essentially, if you have water around you, whether it's water vapor in the air, whether it's an ocean next to you, whether it's a big lake, that's going to lead to a more gradual rise and drop in temperature. That's land water differences. That's why a place like Tennessee might see a temperature range of 100 degrees in a year. So in the summer, they might be 105 degrees and in their winter, they might be like 15 degrees. And those are both totally normal temperatures to have in the summer and in the winter. Whereas here in Santa Barbara, we go from 60 to 80 on any given day. And if we were in San Francisco, San Francisco is the city in the country that has the smallest temperature range. Any given day in San Francisco, it's going to be somewhere between 60 degrees and 70 degrees. <laughs> That's true, their temperature range is about 10 degrees. That doesn't mean that it doesn't get above 70 or below 60. It means that the average temperature on any given day in San Francisco, any time of the year, is somewhere in the 60 to 70 degree zone. <clears throat> we are here in Santa Barbara because we're why? At a lower latitude, we have a greater range. So yeah. So, and finally, temperature controls ocean currents, ocean currents. So I, I made note of us being next to a cold ocean current. Ocean is that way, by the way, <clears throat> from my daughter's room, which is where I am. That's not what I meant to do. 
So here we are. Shoot. Why is... <clears throat> so here we are in California. Um, we are on a cold ocean current. If you remember, we... No, I don't remember if I said this to this class or not. I said this to a class last week. Um, we have the Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force I'm going to go over today, but essentially it means that if you're in the northern hemisphere, water and wind goes clockwise. So if we looked at the <clears throat> ocean circulation here in the northern hemisphere, our uh, water and our air is going in a clockwise rotation. Whereas if we go down here to the southern hemisphere, we're talking about a counterclockwise rotation. That's because of the Coriolis force. I know I've mentioned the Coriolis force, but I have a couple of videos up on it that you're going to watch along with this lecture. Um, <clears throat> it has to do with the rotation of the earth, and I'll get to it in just a minute. But essentially, because of that rotation that leads to the Coriolis force, we have the east side of every continent is going to be a warm current. What's happening is the air and the water, they run along the equator, they get nice and warm. There's all kinds of uh, surplus energy from the sun coming in. That air and that water is getting warm and then it makes its way up here along the east coast. So the east coast of the US is getting a nice warm current and then it keeps going along. <clears throat> goes up here to the Labrador Sea, cools down at the Arctic, and then runs along the west side of these continents with a cold ocean current. Now, the, the cold is going to be relative to where you are. If you're, if you're up here in Canada, right, you're, you're technically in a warm current, but it's had a while to cool down since it was at the equator. Whereas if you're down here in Senegal or in the Gambia, for example, um, again, you're on a, the west side of a continent, so it's a cold current but it's heated up a good amount by the time it gets to Senegal. Um, <clears throat> then it hits the equator and it goes around again. Whereas down here, because air and uh, water go at a counterclockwise, counterclockwise like that, what's happening is the wind and the air heat up along the equator and then they hit the west side, right? That's not right. What am I doing wrong here? Um, that should be like that, right? Because it's, oh yeah, counterclockwise. Okay, so the wind and the air are going along the equator. <clears throat> They're warm. They hit the wet, the east side of South America, hit Brazil with a nice warm air current and a nice warm ocean current, move down, hit the Southern Ocean, gets really, really cold. This is where large penguins live. And then it makes its way back up because of the Coriolis force, hits the west side of this continent with a cold ocean current, and then warms up again and keeps doing that. And that's happening in every single ocean around the world. West side of a continent, always cold water. East side of a continent, always warm water. That doesn't mean that you might not have a jet stream. Like what's happening right here is while they have this cold Atlantic ocean current in Europe, there's also a jet stream that brings warm water off the coast of Portugal and France and Spain. <clears throat> but a jet stream is a little bit different than the general ocean circulation. And we're gonna talk more about ocean circulation next week, but um, good rule of thumb to remember, west side is what? Cold, east side is warm. <clears throat> All right, so our ocean currents make a difference with temperature because of wind. So, I'm going to get into wind in just a minute, but essentially air is always moving to where it's warm. So air has mass. It, we don't think about it because we walk through it all the time, but that mass is all around us. And when air warms up, it gets big. So <clears throat> it's like anything that warms up. So um, sometimes I'll, I'll use my cat, Mr. Chompers, as an example. He's not here. Uh, he is a gigantic cat <clears throat> and when it gets warm he just like spreads out everywhere and then when it gets cold he's like a little orange cinnamon roll 
Um, and that's what's happening with air. That's what's happening when you cook things, right? Have you ever cooked like spaghetti sauce or something like that? Something with a lot of oil in it. If you cook something with a lot of olive oil in it, you notice that as the sauce gets warm, that you start to get these like bigger and bigger sort of circles of, of olive oil, of fat. Uh, that's the same thing that's happening with air. <clears throat> when air heats up it spreads out it gets very big and so because it's now big and less dense it's lighter than the gravity that's pulling it down so it starts to lift and when it starts to lift because it has mass what happens nature doesn't like a vacuum right so when that air lifts more air comes in to fill that space we call that sideways movement of air wind so <clears throat> when we have a warm current, like out here at the Atlantic Ocean, or over here in India and South Asia, um, because while you're going to get the same ocean current circulation here in the Indian Ocean, India dips down into the low latitude so significantly that <clears throat> the ocean currents around India, regardless of the way that it's circulating, are going to be pretty warm. So if we're over here in New York, for example, if we're in South Asia, <clears throat> we're gonna have nice warm air or nice warm water, which leads to nice warm air over the water. So you have a whole lot of air lifting when you have a warm ocean current. And because you have a whole lot of air lifting, what happens? Other air has to come in and fill that space. So if we're on the coast, the East Coast, if we're in the Carolinas, if we're in New York, if we are in South Asia, if we're in Sri Lanka, what we have is a whole lot of low pressure air that is lifting, and we have a whole lot of high pressure air that has sunk, moved sideways to come in and fill that space. So if we imagine what New York is like throughout the year, <clears throat> climate-wise. So just think about New York throughout the year, climate-wise. Um, if you don't know, New York has horribly disgusting hot summers. <clears throat> it's like grossly humid, sticky, disgusting, hot, extreme heat. And you never ever get cool. Like you can get in the shower, you know, which might cool you down, but you're still sweating as soon as the air, the water turns off because there is so much humidity in the air. There's so much water vapor in the air that <clears throat> it just, the heat is just hanging, like literally like hanging in the air. It's the same thing if we were in Tokyo over here. It's the same thing if we were in Shanghai, if we were in uh, Seoul. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna cough, sorry. Sorry, the graveliness of my voice was bugging me. And probably you. Okay, so if we're over here and we're in New York and it's hot and it's schwitzy during the summer, it's gross. It's because, think about it, so um, let's take a city right in here. What would be a city in here? Like St. Paul would be in here. Minnesota is going to be somewhere in here. Minnesota is not a city, I know, but you get the idea. So if you know anything about Minnesota, Minnesota has really, really, really cold winters, like Russian cold winters. Well, you can figure that out just looking at where Minnesota is. High latitude up here. It's still, still, just think about it. Think about how cold Minnesota is or if you don't know, if you haven't experienced it, you probably heard about it, like heard stories about how cold it gets. So think about Minnesota over here and still latitudinally, it's still like not even hitting Russia. It's just hitting like the tip of Southern Russia. Just imagine how cold St. Petersburg must be. So we're over here in Minnesota. Um, they're going to be affected by what? Continentality, right? Because they're right in the middle of this continent. So because they are right in the middle of this continent, right over here, um, during the winter, their temperature is gonna get really, really, really low because of continentality, like we just talked about. Uh, so most of the year, <clears throat> the air, arrows keeps disappearing, the air right here is going to be making its way out to the warm ocean current. That warm ocean current leads to low pressure, it leads to air lifting. More air wants to come in and fill that space. So air rushes from Minnesota, makes its way over to New York, to that low pressure system. And what happens in between is you have this, so it's winter, let's say it's January, is you have this cold air right in here 
that is making its way. Now it's going to heat up a tiny bit, you know, it's going to go a little bit lower in latitude. Um, it might go over like a dark surface, so it heats up. Uh, and it makes its way over the Appalachians, which we know, we remember from the beginning of class, aren't that high of mountains. The highest peak is 3,500 feet. Remember, they're old mountains, so they have eroded down. They're not the Sierra Nevada, which are young and sparkling new with their peaks. Um, but still, it's going to go up over the Appalachians. It's going to dry out because of orographic lifting. And then it's going to rain down into New York, pretty cold and pretty dry. So if it's January, <clears throat> what kind of a winter is New York going to get? New York is going to get a cold, dry, just air basically pummeling in from places like Minnesota, places like Canada, because this cold air that's in the middle of this continent right here is constantly making its way out to the warm ocean current. Now, you might think, okay, you're saying that New York is cold, but the air is going towards a warm ocean current. Remember, it's all relative. So that, that warm ocean current in January off the coast of New York <clears throat> isn't gonna be like a hot tub, um, but it's going to be warmer relative to air in Minnesota. So that air in Minnesota, because this air next to New York over the current is rising, that cold freezing air, January air in Minnesota, makes its way across the continent, goes up over the Appalachians, dries out, pummels down on New York with cold, dry air before making its way to that, that uh, warm ocean current. But then what happens? What happens is summer comes along, right? January ends, spring comes in, and what's gonna start to happen in spring? So in spring, we're gonna to start to see the temperature rise more quickly in a place like Minnesota, right? That doesn't mean that it's going to be hot. That just means that you're going to see a faster temperature change. But remember, they're coming from like minus 20 degrees, so they've got a long way to go up. But uh, they're going to start heating up faster in spring because why? because of continentality, because of the low specific heat capacity. So now we're going to start to see a reversal <clears throat> of the wind that's normally making its way out of the continent to this warm ocean current over here. And now it's reversing and it's being drawn back over to Minnesota. So what we're going to start to see is Minnesota is gonna to start to heat up. Now the air around Minnesota is gonna to start to rise. So that warm air, that warm, wet air that's sitting over the Atlantic Ocean, <clears throat> <coughs> that warm, wet air that's sitting over the Atlantic Ocean is now going to get dragged back into the continent. It's going to make its way over the Appalachians and eventually get to Minnesota. But when it gets dragged into the continent because of, because, so what's essentially happening is most of the winter, the air over New York, if this hand is New York, is rising and the air over Minnesota is sinking and it's being dragged to New York. But for spring starts to happen, now like they're kind of even temperature, and then it's gonna start to heat up faster and faster because of continentality in Minnesota. So now the air that is sitting over the warm currents in New York is gonna get dragged over New York, up over the Appalachians and to Minnesota. When that warm, wet air that is sitting over the Atlantic current gets dragged over New York, that's the schwitz, that's the, that's the humidity, that's the sweat, that's the like disgusting sweat I was describing. That's their summer. <clears throat> Basically, they get these cold, dry winters because they're getting cold, dry air from inside the continent making its way to the Atlantic current. But during the summer, this warm, wet air gets pulled into the continent and it gets it drags across places like the Carolinas and Virginia and New York and it brings this like dense humidity with it leading to these hot disgusting sticky summers the same thing is going to happen over here in Japan right because it's the same it's got a warm current um, you've got the effect of continentality <clears throat> you're on the east side of a continent so when we look at New York, which isn't that different of a latitude from Santa Barbara, or more specifically from San Francisco, well, San Francisco is cool most of the year. Like I said, it has an average temperature range of about, range of about 10 degrees, whereas you go not too far in latitude across the continent to New York, and we're looking at a temperature range that goes to freezing cold in the winter and extremely hot and disgusting in the summer. 
That's the difference of a cold ocean current and a warm ocean current. So when we're talking about temperature controls, <clears throat> we're talking about so many different things working together. So latitude first, altitude, that's a big deal. Cloud cover makes a difference with transmission and with reflection and albedo and stuff like that. Land water differences, continentality, that makes a pretty big difference. And then ocean currents also have a huge effect. So you can be next to an ocean, but if it's a warm ocean, you're gonna see some serious range in your temperature. If it's a cold ocean, you're gonna see a very slight range in your temperature. So to give you some examples, we have places like Libya. <clears throat> so Libya right here, right? North Africa, right in the middle of the Sahara. Um, it can get to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> that's a world high. Uh, and that's air temperature. Land temperature gets much warmer. And then Death Valley, that's another world high. Death Valley over here, Death Valley is happening for a, a bunch of reasons. So Death Valley, on the eastern side of the Sierra, you've got you've got uh, a whole bunch happening. <laughs> you have um, continentality because you're inside the continent, right? You're not right next to the ocean. You are on the the eastern side of the Sierra, so the air is essentially making its way from the cold ocean current off the coast of Santa Barbara, makes its way over California. California is full of mountains, so it's going up and down mountains. It's drying out. It's, you've got the west side of the Sierra that's going to be pretty green, but then the east side of the Sierra, what happens when that air makes its way up over the sharp peaks of the Sierra, we're talking 14,000 feet, and then comes back down the other side on the eastern side of the Sierra, that's orographic lifting. That is what we will talk about next week. <clears throat> that plus a little extension leads to some crazy temperature uh, highs in, in uh, Death Valley. And then we go to Antarctica, way down here, which is a continent, and we've got our world lows of 130 degrees Fahrenheit, um, like a full 160 degrees cooler there. So, let me see. I don't want to. I don't want you to worry about this. I just wanted to show you um, how in Bolivia we have two different. Two different uh, cities here, right? La Paz, which is going to be high up in the Andes, and then Concepcion, which is going to be down in the in like a low latitude in the Amazon. And you have this real change in the range of temperature, where Concepcion is going to see an 80 degree Fahrenheit um, average temperature. It's going to be much warmer, even though look, they're at the same latitude. But the difference with La Paz being at an average of 50 degrees is that they're up in the Andes. That's the difference that elevation can make. And then continentality. Um, this is what I was talking about with transmission and the clouds. I just wanted to show something with, I showed you all of this already. I had a temperature range once upon a time for Tennessee and the temperature range was like negative 10 degrees all the way up to like 95 degrees, depending on time of year because of continentality. <clears throat> so. Those are our temperature, range, our temperature controls. And see how, while latitude is very important, those other ones are nothing to ignore either. They make a huge difference in what your climate is going to be. And next week when we talk about wind and lifting, I'll get into how microclimates are created. And when we talk about microclimates, guess what? Altitude, ocean currents, land water differences, they're gonna make a really big difference with microclimates. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about with microclimates, macroclimate is, um, if we look at the earth, we have general climate zones depending on, on uh, latitude. So if we are in the tropics, where the climate is tropical, it's uh, warm and wet, so you have tropical rainforest, you have a lot of biodiversity, a lot of biomass. And then when we get up here, 20 degrees to 40 degrees north and south of the equator, we get the true desert regions. So, and I know I've said this in class before, but we've got the Sonoran Desert right in there, the Sahara going through the Arabian uh, Peninsula Desert, and then the Gobi Desert up here, which is cold. Um, and down here in the south, we've got the Atacama, the Kalahari, the Victorian Desert. Uh, there's a reason for that, which I'm gonna get into in just a minute, why there are these general 
macro climate trends. So, but that's what I mean by macro climate is that you can look around the tropics, you're gonna get a tropical climate. Now there might be a microclimate in there. There might be an ex a localized exception. Like if you're on the equator, but you're in Quito at a high elevation, that would be a microclimate. So I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So let's switch to our, ne our next other different slideshow. So we've got our temperature controls down, yay. Let's talk about air pressure, wind, and deserts. And I've already been talking about air pressure and wind. Let's go over it more and also have a quote. If you haven't seen this movie or read this book, it's very good. But what do you think about this quote in our current situation of isolation? It's a very difficult era in which to be a person, just a real actual person instead of a collection of personality traits selected from an endless automat of characters. What's that mean to you? And then we're talking about the world like we always are. So because the world is round, it turns me on. <clears throat> All right, let's understand atmospheric pressure. And I've already been explaining this, atmospheric pressure. Um, let's understand wind speed and direction, global wind and pressure patterns, and then local winds. So what is wind? I've been explaining wind. You know what wind is because you've been in the middle of wind. But um, wind is the sideways movement of air. So air that's moving up, air that's moving down is not wind. That's pressure. <clears throat> Why did that just move forward? I didn't tell it to move forward. Um, so air that's moving to the side is wind. And like I just explained when I was talking about temperature controls, the reason that air moves to the side, or what we call advectionally, the reason that wind air moves in an advectional sideways pattern is because of differences in pressure. So pressure systems have to do with where, if air is rising or if it's sinking. And I know that you've heard of pressure before. I know you've heard the meteorologist or, or you know, weather person say something like, oh, we have a high pressure system coming in or a low pressure system coming in. All it's referring to is air. And if air is lifting, it's low pressure. Because think about it, where we're standing, if the air is lifting away from us, it's mass, right? So it's, it's not pushing down on us. So the pressure is low. As opposed to high, when air is sinking, that's going to be high pressure. Air has mass. So if that pressure, if that air is pushing down, literally pushing down on where we're standing, that's high pressure. <clears throat> so when we talk about air pressure, we're talking about relation to us or relation to the surface of the earth. If it's low pressure, it's rising. If it's high pressure, it's sinking. So air, like I've said many times, has mass. We don't think about it because it's around us. Um, and when air heats up, I know, I know I've already explained this, but let me just say it again. When air heats up, it gets big, so it's less dense, so it's less controlled by gravity. So it's gonna rise up. But then what happens to air when it moves up in elevation? It cools down, right? Because of adiabatic cooling. So when that air cools down, what it's gonna do <clears throat> is it's gonna get tighter and tighter. So when it gets tighter, now you have air that's gonna be more dense, it's gonna be heavier, so it gets pulled back down to the surface of the earth. Why? Because of gravity. So when it's warm, it's all spread out. It's lighter. It floats up. When it goes up in elevation, it condenses. It cools down. And so now it's dense. And so gravity pulls it back down. So that's high pressure because it's sinking. Low pressure because it's rising. <clears throat> now, notice that spring and fall tend to be windier times of year. Can you tell me why? Why would wind be heavier during the spring and during the fall? Well, it's because what we were talking about with continentality, because there's gonna be differences in how temperature is starting to rise in the summer. So for example, we're coming out of winter right now and places like Minnesota <clears throat> or Utah are going to start heating up faster because of continentality. We're next to the ocean, boys. What happens when I do like four of these in a day? So, <clears throat> um, oh. Uh, 
It tells me that I'm muted when I start coughing because it's like, they can't hear you because you're coughing. <clears throat> okay. So um, because of continentality, places like Utah or places like Minnesota are going to start to heat up now. So they're coming out at the end of winter. The sun is focusing higher and higher in uh, the Northern hemisphere. So now you're going to start to see temperature changes, but because we're next to the ocean, it's gonna take longer for our temperature to rise because of high specific heat capacity. Whereas if you're in Utah, you're just in the middle of a rock basically, and you're gonna to start to see your temperature rise pretty fast. So because of that uneven distribution of air, because we have this uh, low pressure or high pressure in different parts of, of the continent right now, air is gonna start to move quickly because basically we have some places that have been very cold that are now heating up. So they were cold, dense air was, was pushing down on the surface of the earth. Um, but now they're starting to heat up. So they're starting to see low pressure, which means that more air is gonna come in and start to move around. So does that make sense to you? So because spring and fall, you start to see uneven, uh, uneven heating and cooling of the Earth's surface, we start to see more wind. And that works perfectly because what's happening in the spring? What's happening in the spring is the beginning of spring, right? It's the beginning of life. And what does that wind facilitate? What does it bring with it? Pollen, seeds. So the adaptation of our of our um, of our biology of our life here in the biosphere, it's adapted to things like the heating and the cooling of the earth that have led to the sideways advectional movement of air that leads to the spreading of things like pollen and seeds um, that leads to the beginning of uh, of life in spring. So um, atmospheric pressure, like I keep saying down here, we have high pressure, the air is, well, when, when you have air that's more dense, when it's cooler, it's more dense, and so gravity pulls it down. When air is warm and spread out, it's lighter, and it floats up. So air density depends on pressure and temperature. Density has to do with how tightly packed the mass of air is. Um, so we have particles of air all around us. If they're tightly packed, then they're going to be denser and heavier. If they're more loosely packed, they're going to be lighter. Atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude. We talked about that last week when we talked about the atmosphere, if you remember. Um, wind, like I keep saying, is the horizontal movement of air. We also call it advection, advectional movement of air. Um, it's a renewable resource. The age just constantly happens because of the heating and cooling of the Earth's surface. Too bad we can't tap into that somehow. Here's something important. I mean, all of this is important, but here's something else important. Uh, wind direction. So the origin of the wind is what the wind is named after. So when you're talking about a westerly wind, <clears throat> it means that that wind is moving east, and that it came from the west and it's moving east. If you ever heard of like a westerly wind, like, oh, we're getting the westerlies, that means that it starts in the west and it's moving east. So wind is named after the direction it starts in, where it's coming from, not in where it's going. Uh, west wind moves from west to east, like I said, so it's moving east, it starts in the west. You measure wind with a wind vane. So wind speed and direction are determined by three different things. Pressure gradients. Remember, if you have high pressure or low pressure, it's going to move, like lead to the sideways movement of air. So here we have low pressure and high pressure. Air sinking hits the surface of the earth, comes in and fills this empty space, right? <clears throat> the Coriolis effect. Okay, so the Coriolis effect is something that I keep mentioning. I want you to go now on Canvas and watch the two videos, they're short videos, two videos that I posted on the Coriolis force. So go watch them. Okay, so now you're back. <clears throat> and you know what the Coriolis effect is. You know that it has to do with the rotation of the Earth and the apparent um, clockwise and counterclockwise movement of air and wind in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. And then we have friction. The next thing with wind is friction. I'm going to get into friction in just a minute. So pressure gradients, 
These are called isobars. Isobars, if you've taken a mapping class or if you've taken the uh, physical geography lab, you've learned about isobars. But isobars are lines that measure an equal variable. So that variable can be different things. It could be heat, it could be rain, it could be elevation. But depending on how close these lines are, these isobars are, or how far away they are, tells you how intense that variable is. So for example, if we were looking at a topo topographic map, <clears throat> and we were hiking, and we wanted to go up a mountain, but we don't want to go straight up that mountain. You can't walk just like straight up a mountain. You got to kind of zigzag, right? And you want to figure out, okay, how am I going to get to the top of this mountain without going like straight up a cliff and having to climb it? Um, how can I find like a gradual path up this mountain? Well, you would look at lines of elevation and if those isobars were very, very close together on a map, if you had isobars <clears throat> that are essentially like, um, my thing over here. <clears throat> really high tech. So if we look at <clears throat> this nipple-like drawing that I just made, um, what we're, if this was a topographic map and we were looking at getting to the top of this mountain, what we're looking at is a flat map, right? <clears throat> but the closer together these ISO lines are, the steeper it is. So we know that right here, we're gonna go up a gradual hill, gradual hill, but when we start to get closer, to this side of the mountain, now it's gonna get pretty steep. So we might wanna go kind of around here and the isobars are more further spread apart from each other. So we know that this is gonna be more gradual and then we're gonna go do like a little zigzag and boom, we're at the top. Just literally turned it into a nipple. Um, <clears throat> so, so, when we're looking, the map that we're looking at right here has to do with air pressure. It has to do with high pressure or low pressure. And so right here, we have the L, we're over Nashville. We're gonna have a low pressure system. What does that mean? Where's the air going? Up in elevation, because it's going up in elevation. You have a high pressure cell over here in Oklahoma City that is sinking. And so that high pressure cell is gonna follow the low pressure cell around. Basically, high pressure is following low pressure. Warm air is being fo followed by cold air. It's not always warm and cold, but usually uh, low pressure is warm air and high pressure is cooler air because it's that's one of the easiest ways for density to change. So when we're looking at pressure gradients, the high pressure is always following the low pressure. It's always following the low pressure around because here the air mass is being displaced. The high pressure hits the surface of the earth and then moves sideways advectionally into this low pressure, fills that empty space. An isobar, like I said, line on a map drawn. Um, isobars are specifically looking at, at pressure gradients. An iso line is looking at uh, any kind of variable. So I was using isobar and iso line kind of interchangeably, but an iso line, there's different iso somethings, iso hat, for example. Um, it's measuring a line where the variable is the same or different. So we could look, like I said, at rainfall, at air pressure, at snowfall, yada, yada, yada. The more widely spaced, the weaker the gradient, the weaker the wind is gonna be, just like the weaker the elevation was on our topo map. And the more closely spaced, well, now you're getting some high winds. You're getting into some, uh, you know, seasonal allergy kind of winds. So once again, we have our unequal heating of the Earth's surface that leads to different pressure gradients. Here we have this air that's warming. It goes up in elevation. So it's, it's a low pressure system, right? Because that air is rising in elevation. And then it goes up higher in the atmosphere. It starts to cool down because of adiabatic cooling. So now it's dense. And so now we're gonna see high level winds. So high atmospheric winds. There's a name for that, don't worry. Those high atmospheric winds are called geostrophic winds. I'll show you on a slide in just a minute. <clears throat> but then 
you can have this cooler air that's now up here, high up in the atmosphere, and then gravity's gonna pull it back down. So now you have a high pressure system. So you have this low pressure system, and now you have this dense air, it's gonna drop back down, high pressure system. Coriolis force, you already went and watched those videos, two videos that I showed, one should have been a merry-go-round, one should have had like a plane going, like why a plane from Texas doesn't go straight up, why it kind of curves. But if we, so you should understand the Coriolis force. If you don't, please let me know. <clears throat> so um, if we look at uh, the direction that air and wind is going, it's going to the right in the Northern Hemisphere or clockwise and counterclockwise in the South, like I keep saying, but here it's written down. You can pause this if you need to. So once again, we have the Coriolis force. Remember that makes a difference when it comes to wind. Like we said, there are three things that affect wind. Geostrophic winds, those are those high level winds, those upper level winds I was just talking about. Those are winds that happen not down here on the surface of the earth, but high up in the atmosphere, <clears throat> well, high relative to us, high up in the troposphere. Um, so geostrophic wind, that's what that is. Pause this, write it down. And then frictional force. Remember I said the third thing affecting wind is frictional force. So uh, frictional force is literally what it sounds like or if you don't know what friction is. Um, so we have, let's say we have air that's, that's moving sideways advectionally, we call that wind, along a surface and it's moving along like a very smooth surface. There's not going to be a lot of friction. So it's going to cause maybe turbulence or something like that. It's just going to smoothly move along, it's going to pick up speed because nothing's inhibited, inhibiting its movement. Whereas if, if you have some sort of friction moving along that surface, sand or pebbles or rock or something like that, that's going to affect the movement of that wind. Um, and then there's, there's other frictional forces, frictional forces like hitting a pressure gradient. If you're moving along sideways and then you start to move into a low pressure or a high pressure system. Uh, but frictional force exerted by the ground surface, it's proportional to wind speed, it's going to affect wind speed. Basically, if you imagine the plains, just grassland everywhere, and you have air that's just moving along, moving along, nothing, no friction, nothing is causing it to bump along or slow down. Just imagine like how fast that wind is going to be as opposed to frictional force, which might slow it down or change the, bumpiness, imagine being in a plane. All right, <clears throat> so a cyclone is something that comes from a result of frictional force. And do we wanna go into cyclones here or next week? Because a cyclone is a circular movement of air. Yeah, we'll just talk about it right now. Um, so a cyclone is a circular movement of air. So what essentially is happening is you have a low pressure system, right? Air that's rising um, and you have a high pressure system. <clears throat> it's coming in to fill that space, but I'm gonna talk about this next week because I'm going to talk about storms next week when I talk about clouds and stuff like that. So, so, so look at this frictional force and cyclone and I'm gonna get more into detail with it next week. And I have a video on hurricanes, which hurricanes are a type of cyclone. Hurricane, typhoon, those are the same types of storms. They're cyclones. A tornado is a cyclone. I have another video on tornadoes you all are gonna watch next week. So let's wait on that, but you can look and see a cyclone as a center of low pressure, um, where low pressure and high pressure are converging. <clears throat> and then, an anticyclone is high pressure with low pressure. So if the cyclone is low pressure, low pressure air going up with high pressure swirling around it, sinking down, it's hard to do. Um, the anticyclone is high pressure being circled by low pressure. It's going like that. And again, I'll get into that next week when we talk about hurricanes, but it has to do with wind as well. So. Can pause this and write down that anticyclone. Okay, so now here comes the super fun part. We're gonna build a model of the circulation of air around the globe. So here's our globe. <clears throat> and remember, the globe wouldn't look like this because why? Because it would be fatter in the middle, right? Squatter. Oh, why is that moving without me telling it to move? Okay, so 
we know that this is the equator and the sun is going to focus its energy in here 23 and a half degrees north and south of the equator so here comes the sun and it's focusing in here now be oh my god why is this moving without me so with our sun focusing on the equator and in the tropics what's that going to lead to a low pressure system right so what's going to happen is you have the sun coming in and <clears throat> and heating the tropics heating around the equator so you're going to get a low pressure system so right here we're going to have a low pressure system so low pressure because the air the sun is coming in it's heating up the air that air is rising and then up here at the poles it's going to be a high pressure system because the air is very very cold at the poles so it's going to be all dense so it's constantly going to be sinking towards the surface of the earth so at the equator mm, at the equator, we have a low pressure system. At the poles, we have a high pressure system. And then what happens is that low pressure system brings the air up in elevation. What happens when air goes up in elevation? It adiabatically cools. So now, oh, mm. so now it gets dense. So now it's dense, so it's not going to continue to rise, but it's going to move sideways. What's that high level wind called? geostrophic wind air over here that sinks towards the pole I swear to god air that sinks towards the poles is going to converge with the surface of the earth now that it's converged with mass mass that hits mass is going to make its way down so you've got at the equator air that's rising and it gets up to a high elevation oh, I swear to god and then <clears throat> it moves at a high elevation to the side and then over here in the poles, we have high pressure, sinks, hits the surface of the earth, converges with the surface of the earth, and now moves at a low level, low elevation wind along the surface of the earth. Okay. So now we have, look at that. What is it? What is it, you guys? It's a convection cell. So we have our low air pressure that rises up. And then it starts to move to the side, advectionally, high elevation, geostrophic wind. And now remember, it's dense. So what's going to happen? The air is going to get pulled down to the surface of the Earth. And when it gets pulled down to the surface of the Earth because of gravity, it's going to heat up as it goes down. So over here <clears throat> at the equator, the air warm was warm and rised, raised, rose risen um i guess that's okay uh so the air went up in elevation and when air goes up in elevation what does it do it condenses and when it condenses if it has water vapor and it has a lot of water vapor around the tropics uh it's going to precipitate it's going to rain so around the equator we're going to have low pressure we're going to have low pressure and we are going to have air that is like condensing so we're going to have rain so we're going to have a lot of clouds around the equator and we're going to have a lot of rain and we're going to have a lot of heat that's why we have so much biodiversity around the equator and then that air is going to make its way up in elevation it's going to cool down and when it cools down it's now moving sideways geostrophic winds and the gravity of the earth is going to pull that dense air down in elevation and when air gets pulled down in elevation it heats up if air goes down in temperature as it goes up in elevation, it goes up in temperature as it goes down in elevation. So what's gonna happen right at about 20 to 40 degrees north and south of the equator? <clears throat> You're gonna get hit with high, a high pressure system that is warm, dry air. And what did I say happened right around 20 to 40 degrees north and south of the equator? The true deserts of the world. So <clears throat> when we look at the tropics we're going to see a climate and a biodiversity that correlates with that climate so we're going to see a climate that is warm and wet so we're going to see all kinds of biodiversity all kinds of living things we're going to have a whole tropical forest wonderland that we call a tropical rainforest and then because of the way that air moves up in elevation and dries out because of the way that gravity pulls that air back down to the surface of the earth, now we're going to be pummeled with dry, warm air right around the Sonoran Desert, 
the Sahara Desert, the uh, Victorian Desert, the Kalahari Desert, see? So um, <clears throat> that air, once it hits right around 20 to 40 degrees, <coughs> and you might ask why it's, why it's between 20 and 40 degrees. And if you can figure that out, that's great, but I'll tell you in just a minute. So now that air is gonna converge with the surface of the earth and part of it's going to go back down to this low pressure because we have a convection cell right here. How do I stop this thing from moving? I don't know why it's doing that. So we have our nice little convection cell here. Remember I said that's what makes the world go around. Um, but then you're also gonna have some air that's gonna make its way up to 60 degrees north of the equator. So we have air that's hitting right at about, let's say 30 degrees and it's going to get pulled south to this low pressure system. But then we're also gonna have a low pressure system right here. What is creating that low pressure system? Because this is Alaska, this is gonna be cold. So what's creating that low pressure system? It's convergence. The air from the poles and the air from 30 degrees converge with the surface of the earth and they now move towards each other and then they hit each other and low pressure. Because those air masses converge, they get pushed up in elevation, and now we have a low pressure system, but that low pressure system is gonna be a cool low pressure system. So remember how I said that most pressure systems, if it's a low pressure system, it's warm air, and most high pressure systems are cool air, but not always. And here are two exceptions. This high pressure system right here is gonna be warm, dry air, and this low pressure system in Alaska is gonna be cool, wet air because it's a low pressure system. And here in California, if you think about when we get rain, it's in the winter, we're getting it from the low pressure system that, conver that this converging air right over Alaska leads to. So now you can go forward. So we call this cell right here, this convection cell, the Hadley cell. That's the convection cell that's happening um, in between the equator and about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. We call it the Hadley cell. The ITCZ, see then it moved at an okay time, um, is an intertropical convergence zone. So the intertropical convergence zone is where you have the air at, that's coming from 30 degrees and 30 degrees north and south of the equator and then is coming back to the equator. It now, it's, remember it has mass, so it's going to converge and then rise up again leading to that Hadley cell once again. So right in here, there's gonna be a little space right in the intertropical convergence zone, the ITCZ, that has no air. So there's going to be, because that air is converging and then rising, it doesn't actually like ever blend into itself. It basically just and hits. So you're gonna have this little strip along what we call the inter intertropical convergence zone that has no air. So it's gonna be just this dead zone. Um, if you have read uh, A Wrinkle in Time, there's this part of A Wrinkle in Time where they get to the doldrums. The doldrums is referring to this little space right in here. <clears throat> and um, if you have seen like Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that, there's also some place where like the ship gets into this area that is um, that like no wind is moving, that would have been the intertropical convergence zone. Okay, so we have this air that's converging up here, like I said, this leads to our polar fronts, low pressure, low pressure, that leads to cold storms. So those are the blizzards that you get, the northeasterlies, the cold winter storms are gonna be a result of this low pressure system that meets at about 60 degrees north of the equator. So we've got air that's moving in this way, our Hadley cell over here, um, our low pressure system that happens right around Alaska, 60 degrees north and south of the equator. I know Alaska is not south of the equator. Okay, so now we have our major movement of air around the world. So we have we finished the circulation of air around the world. The air that's rising here, the air that's sinking here is leading to all these reactions throughout the, um, the earth. And so what's happening is wind should be constantly moving towards these low pressure systems, right? So is this an accurate model? 
is it an accurate model? It's not because of the Coriolis force. Because the earth is rotating, wind does not move just straight up and down. Wind moves to the side. So because of the Coriolis force, what's happening here is you have high pressure, low pressure, air that's sinking, air that's rising. And remember, air is always moving towards low pressure. So if air is always moving towards low pressure, the pattern of air should go towards 60 degrees and towards zero degrees. But it's not going to go in a straight line. Basically, the air isn't going from Alaska straight down to Ecuador. What's happening is the Coriolis force is happening. So everything is deflecting apparently to the right or to the left, depending on if you're in the uh, Northern hemisphere or in the Southern hemisphere. So because of that apparent deflection, wind is actually moving west to east or east to west. So that's why we have our wind, the polar easterlies, the westerlies. Remember, wind is named after the direction that it originated. So west westerlies are going to start in the west and move to the east. The trade winds are named that because this is like before people had boats that, um, you know, had like a steam engine or, or the engines that we have today, they were all powered by the wind. And so if you got into, if you got into what were called the trade winds, that's where people who were going from Europe, going from North Africa, going from East Asia, later going to and from the Americas, they would have used the trade winds to get around the earth. That's why they're called the trade winds. Okay, so there we go. Um, and then this is also another way of looking at the surface of the earth. So we've got the Hadley cell, remember? We've got the westerlies, the easterlies. We've got this um, low pressure happening at 60 degrees north and south of the equator. Now, I asked earlier if you could figure out why the true deserts are between 20 and 40 degrees. Why aren't they just in the same place? Why do we have low pressure happening here at the equator? And then we have this high pressure sinking at around 30 degrees, but why does it move between 20 and 40 degrees? So why? Well, remember the earth is at a tilt and that the focus of the sun isn't always right at the equator. The sun is the declination of the sun is above the equator twice a year. So the de declination of the sun, if you remember, is where the sun is directly overhead. That happens on the vernal equinox, equinox and on the autumnal equinox. So in spring and in fall. But the rest of the year, the sun is either gradually moving up here to 23 and a half degrees north or gradually moving down to 23 and a half degrees south. And with it, this whole pressure system gets pulled up and down. So this pressure system that so neatly fits on the globe with this low pressure system, high pressure system, low pressure system, high pressure system, it all shifts depending on where the sun is focused and with it, the wind. And with the wind, the spread of seed and the spread of pollen and temperature and low pressure and high pressure and all of that stuff. Does that make sense? So that's one of the reasons that our true deserts spread out because basically this high pressure system is sometimes hitting down here and sometimes hitting up here. And that's the reason that here in Southern California in the, in the winter, <clears throat> we get these storms that are happening. Okay, so if, if we have a low pressure system happening right around Alaska, imagine this is Alaska. Well, what happens when the sun gets pulled down and is sitting above 23 and a half degrees south of the equator? What happens is this low pressure system is right there. So then a high pressure system that's going to correlate with it with the Hadley cell is going to be right about there. And then low pressure system, the one that's normally all the way up here, is going to be pulled all the way down to Santa Barbara. So in the winter, we're going to get storms that originated over Alaska because the entire this entire uh, pressure system that we see is going to get pulled down. So the declination of the sun is going to be at 23 and a half degrees south of the equator on December 21st, which means that this low pressure system gets pulled down right to where we are in California. If that makes sense. So because the sun is moving around, the warming, the high pressure system, the low pressure system, it's all getting pulled up and down 
um, from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And that's how we have seasons. That's how we have seasons. Um, we have seasons up here in the mid latitudes because we're getting hit sometimes with a pressure system that is normally focused on the equator, comes all the way up to 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. And then sometimes that pressure system gets pulled all the way down to 23 and a half degrees south, which means that the cool air that's normally sitting over Alaska gets pulled down to the rest of North America. That's why the mid latitude has seasons, but low latitudes don't really have seasons. Low latitudes don't really have seasons. It's pretty much always hot and wet or hot and dry. But you don't have like the seasons that we talk about in mid latitudes with fall and winter and spring and summer because you don't have that range in those pressure systems. Here's another way to look at our tropical circulation. We're over the equator right here. There's low pressure, goes up in elevation. What does it do? Cools down, moves advectionally at a high elevation. We call that geostrophic wind. <clears throat> And then it gets pulled back down to the surface of the earth because of gravity, leading to subtropical high pressure uh, belts that cause true deserts like the Sonoran Desert, like the, the Kalahari over here, like the Sahara over here. Hadley Cell, remember, is this system of air pressure that's happening right in between the subtropical high pressure belt and the low pressure belt on the tropics. Hadley zone. And then the intertropical convergence zone, like I talked about, is where that air almost meets and then rises. And you've got this little strip of just no wind happening right in between where that, that air is converging and then uh, right in there, no wind. It's kind of like also if you were in the eye of a storm, if you've ever heard of a hurricane, like a hurt, I know you've heard of a hurricane, but if you've heard of the eye of the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane is like flat and dead, right? There's no, there's no air blowing in the eye of the hurricane. <clears throat> That's because it's an intertropical convergence zone, or it's not, it's a, it's a convergence zone of air, but that's the same thing that's happening. Basically, all this air is converging, but right in the middle, there's this little dead zone with no air. The doldrums, that's the term that I used earlier with um, when I was talking about a wrinkle in time. So the doldrums, that's that. That's that like part of intertropical conversion zone where there's just no air. And if you were a sailor and the only thing that powered your boat was wind, well, if you got into the doldrums, you were dead. Nothing was gonna get you out of there. There's no wind coming along. Let's get out and start rowing. Okay. <clears throat> um, monsoons are a big storm that we get in South Asia, Southeast Asia. Now, I, I mentioned typho uh, typhoons before and uh, hurricanes and tornadoes. That is a different type of storm. That's a cyclonic storm that we're gonna come back to. But this monsoon storm leads to really, really heavy wind and, uh, and rain <clears throat> in July and August. And so what's happening, let's say we're down here in South Asia, let's use South Asia as an example. So what's happening here in South Asia is most of the year remember the ocean next to south asia is going to be warm and so that ocean you have a whole lot of the sun's energy you have a warm ocean current so the air is going to constantly be rising over the ocean in south asia it's going to be warm it's going to be spitzy it's going to be very humid <clears throat> if you guys have ever done hot yoga hot yoga was made to replicate how people did yoga in the middle of the day in South Asia. So just imagine that the person who came up with hot yoga was trying to replicate just what the day was like, just being in South Asia. So if you can imagine like how hot and how humid that is. So most of the year, this is Russia up here. Remember most of the year because of continentality and because of a high latitude, Russia is very cold. So most of the year, the air from Russia is trying to get the hell out of Russia. So it's just Russian down here. Oh. Um, <clears throat> and then it's going to hit the Himalayas, right? The Himalayas are right here. Big mountains, huge mountains, created from two converging continental plates. Remember that? So here comes the air, and it's cold, and it's going to make its way over the Himalayas. What happens when air goes over mountains? It dries out. So most of the year, there's air coming from northern asia 
<clears throat> making its way into southern Asia, and that air is cool and dry. But most of the year, they're getting, they're still influenced by this warm, humid air that's sitting over the Indian Ocean. So they're getting some dry, cooler air. It's going to warm up as it comes down in latitude, and it's going to dry out as it goes over the Himalayas. But then they're getting this warm, wet air. All right, but then what happens in July and August? We get those short, brief, hot summers in Russia because of why? Continentality. Because remember, Russia is basically a gigantic rock. Rock has a low specific heat capacity. When the sun is now focused in the northern hemisphere, Russia just heats up and has these really short, really hot winter summers. So for that short period of time, the warm, wet air that's sitting over the Indian Ocean is going to rush to Russia and it's going to make its way to this low pressure system that's happening for a brief period of time during the summer. And when it gets pulled over South Asia and up the Himalayas, when that air that's, and just imagine like how dense with water vapor it is, when that air hits the Himalayas, it's going to orographically lift, lift because it's hitting a mountain and it's going to make its way up over the mountain and it's going to, the Himalayas are steep, right? We're talking about the highest mountains in the world. So when that air goes up over the Himalayas, it's just going to condense and just like be all the water vapor, just imagine is being like ringed out of the air and it's just going to just pummel South Asia with water. We call those storms monsoons. So monsoon in Arabic means reversal of wind because there is this seasonal reversal of wind that happens because of continentality um, and because of the declination of the sun being in the northern hemisphere. And that leads to monsoonal rains. Monsoonal rains are serious. We, we measure our rain by inches here in Santa Barbara, right? Um, a big rainstorm, the one that led to the Montecito debris flow was when we had a rainstorm that dumped five inches in an hour. Well, in monsoonal rains, they measure their rainfall by feet you can imagine. So not by inches, but by feet. So there's some serious rain. There you go. Monsoon starting. Um, these are the subtropical high pressure zones I was talking about that lead to deserts. <clears throat> and the westerlies once again. And our mid-latitude circulation, the jet stream. Uh, high speed airflow in a narrow band. I'm going to read that. Pause it and read it if you want. Oh, Rossby waves. <clears throat> so I posted something on Canvas about Rossby waves, a whole little article and a video that shows them moving around. But Rossby waves happen both in the air and in the water. And they're happening because of the, so most waves, and you can see now a lot of different things are leading to wind. Things like change in pressure, frictional force leads to speed differences and stuff like that. Um, and then most waves, if you remember back to when we talked about waves, are created from the frictional force of that wind pulling over the ocean and pulling up waves. So the kind of ocean waves, the waves that like hit the, the uh, shore, those are being created from the frictional force of wind over the ocean. But a Rossby wave, a Rossby wave is happening because of the, the uh, rotation of the earth. So um, Rossby waves happening inside the ocean and also in the air, they're a result of the rotation of the earth. <clears throat> so a lot of wind, a lot of waves are a result of friction, but Rossby waves are a result of that. And there's another way of looking at high pressure sinking, low pressure rising. Look at low pressure, high pressure, high pressure is falling to low pressure. <sighs> And then here is our circulation, just to give you an idea of where. Um, so this is July. So uh, what is that? That's the um, North Pole. <laughs> and if you look at the movement of air and water away, because it's sinking down and moving towards here, yeah. Pause this and, and look at the way that the arrows change depending on if it's January or July. And then there is another view of our circulation of, of uh, air. And there's another, we already looked at that, just to review. Okay. <clears throat> so 
last thing um, is a little what we call sea breezes and land breezes. So I'm going to come back to this when I, when I talk about fog next week, when we talk about clouds and stuff like this. But when we look at daily cycles of winds like sea breezes and land breezes, they're a result of microclimates. So we've been looking at big winds, global winds that are a result of the sun and these pressure systems that happen all over the globe. But then here in Santa Barbara and in other places, of course, they're strongly affected by things like sea breezes and land breezes. So I want you to think about what you know about why air moves in which direction and what you know about continentality and what you know about low specific heat capacity and high specific heat capacity. And tell me, first of all, you would know that sea breeze would be named after what? Remember, wind is named after where it starts. So sea breeze is coming over the sea onto the land. And a land breeze, land wind, is going to start on the land and go to the ocean, go to the water. So when would we get a sea breeze? Would we get a sea breeze? Would, would air be coming off of the ocean and going onto the land in the morning or in the evening? Think about it. Continentality, all that stuff is going to affect it. So because this has a low specific, sorry, high specific heat capacity here in the ocean um, and the sun comes up, the land is going to heat up faster, right? So air is going to make its way across the sea over the land in the morning, more likely. And then uh, <clears throat> it might continue into the afternoon, um, depending on depending on like how like how fast San Ynez gets heated up or something like that. But basically, because the land is going to heat up faster, we're going to get the sea breeze earlier in the day. So that's going to be your first breeze because the land is going to heat up faster. It's going to lead to a low pressure system. Air over the ocean is going to make its way towards that low pressure system. But then the sun's gonna go down. And the land, let's say San Inez Valley, the temperature's gonna drop there much faster. But the air over the ocean here in Santa Barbara has just heated up, it took all day to heat up. So now the air of the ocean is gonna be warmer, which means that that air that is now sinking and chilling here in San Inez is gonna make its way to the sea, leading to a land breeze in the afternoon, late afternoon into the evening. Now, um, depending on the time of year, so mountain breeze, valley breeze, once again, is going to have to do with who's heating up when. <clears throat> valley breeze starting in the valley, mountain breeze starting in the mountain going into the valley. When are we going to get a valley breeze? When are we going to get a mountain breeze? So we're going to get the valley breeze during the day. Why is that? Why are we going to get more of a valley breeze during the day? Because, remember, it's starting in the valley going to the mountains. You're going to have that air warm in the valley, so it's going to start to rise. It's going to make its way up the mountains. And then during once the evening happens, the sun's going to go down. The valley's going to cool pretty quickly. So now the air on the mountain is going to make its way into this valley. Um, so here in Santa Barbara and in Southern California, we sometimes refer to our Santa Ana winds or our Chinook winds. So our Santa Ana winds are Chinook winds. Those are a um, land breeze that happens in the afternoon that usually happens in fall. So I'm going to come back to and explain why we get these Chinook and Santa Ana winds. They're, those are the same kind of wind. It's a really, really warm, really dry wind. Sometimes they're called fire starters. So when do we get them? We get them in fall, right? That's when we get fires here in Santa Barbara. And a lot of them are sparked by the Santa Ana winds, by the Chinook winds. And so I'm gonna come back to these winds because they have to do with our microclimate here with the mountains and the ocean and the valley and all that stuff. And they correlate really well with fog. So next week we're gonna talk fog. We're going to talk clouds. We're going to talk precipitation. We're going to talk about um, lifting. I keep saying orographic lifting. I know that I've said that throughout the class. Orographic lifting is when air hits a mountain and gets lift over a mountain. Remember that word orog, O-R-O-G, means in Latin, mountain. Um, so we're going to talk about different types of air lifting next week. And that's pretty much it. Next week, I think, is our last week. We just have to talk about clouds, wind, lifting, precipitation, Santa Ana winds. I'll come back and talk about Santa Ana winds again. Um, but a Santa Ana wind is a valley 
or a land breeze. It's coming from in the valley, in the land, making its way to the ocean. All right, so there you go. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, oh, we also talk about ocean circulation next week. Okay.